people are ready for the word tonight. <clears throat> um, it's funny that um, God had me to speak because I actually was preparing a meeting just for the women on this topic that I was like putting together the whole presentation and I was going to send out the email about the topic of writing our vision because we're getting ready to go into a new year. You guys know that we teach at this church that a new year, you know, your new year with God can start any day. It doesn't have to be December 31st. It can start any, any day, any time. But God capitalizes on our mindset where we're ready to turn over a new leaf. So he like, well, if it's going to be December 31st, if you ready December 31st, well, thank the Lord because I've been talking to you whole year. And so <clears throat> I really want to start pushing you right now. I don't want to wait until December to start pushing you to start evaluating where your life is right now and where you want it to go. Because this is, is, this is the thing, and I had this later in my notes, but the issue with Christianity a lot of times, and I've, I've seen us gravitate away from it, and people are getting better, but once upon a time, we treated God like Santa Claus, and we gave all responsibility to him and none to ourselves. It was just once you're a Christian, that's all you have to be, and that's the end of that. I can't even tell y'all that I'm still waiting on the check that's coming in the mail in 30 days. I'm waiting on like six of them. It's check in the mail for 30 days. Y'all, it's been 30 million days and I haven't seen the check in the mail because this is what we were told. This is, these are the things that were told to us, unexpected money. And, uh, and you don't have to do nothing but just sit there and be a believer. And the problem is, Something happened where I started to get older and I entered the workforce and I started working in corporate America and I was in all of these different cultures and all of these different beliefs. And then the fact that every time I would go to the doctor, I had a foreign doctor who was either Muslim or Buddhist and they were doing so much better than me financially. Their lives were stable or they, they weren't struggling and living from paycheck to paycheck like the community I lived in. And I started to say, now something is wrong. Because according to what we've been taught, we're, we're serving a God that owns it all, but we're struggling. So what is the problem? The problem is we've taken our authority and we've pushed it back in God's face. And the reality is anything that you achieve with God will be a partnership you will absolutely positively have a responsibility. And whereas we've taken our authority and given it all back to him, the children of the world have been more wise than us because they've taken their authority and they've lived by Christian principles without knowing it. They've taken their authority to be fruitful and multiply. That's not just having children. That's saying every gift, every talent, every ability, I'm going to take it and work it. Now, whereas with believers, this is the advantage we have. When we work what's been given to us, we now have favor, which is an advantage. And so when you're thinking about where you want your life to go and you're evaluating where it is right now, there are things that I'm sure you want to change. And sometimes you sit back and say, I don't know how to change this. I don't know how to do this. And you can put the first slide up there. The reason that I call this writing our vision is because it's not just your vision. It's your vision with God. This is something that is a joint vision. It is something that he's actively involved in. He's actively facilitating. Sometimes I've sat down and I've <clears throat> wrote out a vision and once upon a time, I, 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 that wasn't something that I did, but it's something I've started doing in recent years. But this is the thing, you don't write just one vision. You write them over and over again and they change over time. Because this is the thing, any vision that we write is elastic with the Lord. 
He has the ability to come in and fine tune and tweak it. Listen, because he don't tell you all of anything at any time. It's, it's full of surprises and full of journeys in your walk with the Lord. And so we're going to get into this tonight. And please feel free to take notes, even if it's just taking pictures on the screen. And so the second slide is, what is a vision? <clears throat> and this is taken from the Webster's. A vision is the faculty or state of being able to see. It is the ability to think about or plan the future with imagination or wisdom. And so when you're thinking of a vision, a vision is different than a plan. You start to plan based on your vision. But a vision is pretty much an image or a picture or an outcome that you want. And for those that are saying, you know, should I write a five-year, 10-year? Listen, y'all, don't, I don't want to say don't waste your time. Let's just start with a year. Because let me tell y'all something. Every little vision I've ever had in my mind, every vision board, all of that stuff, I think they're great. But none of them have gone the way that I thought. Because... There, there's a learning curve when it comes to writing these things. And as you grow in the spirit, you learn how to write them. Up until that point, everything you're writing is just the things you're going to think, you're going to do. But ultimately, there's a picture in your mind and in your heart that you're trying to achieve when you're thinking of writing a vision. And so I want to go to Habakkuk chapter 2, 1 through 3. Because this is a very common verse that we use, and it says this. Sorry, y'all have to navigate on this Apple device that is subpar. It's not the same as a beautiful Android device. And so y'all just bear with me. Amen. Amen. I'm stuck with it now. But Habakkuk chapter 2, 1 through 3 says, And I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision or write the vision and inscribe it on tablets that the one who reads it may run, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. It hastens toward the goal, and it will not fail, though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come, and it will not delay. And so we've taught this verse in the sense um, of write the vision and make it plain, and the person that reads it is going to run every time they read it. But actually, in this passage, Habakkuk was a prophet, and he I want you to write it neat and I want you to write it clear so that the one that you give it to who is actually a herald, the word um, in the Greek means herald, H-E-R-A-L-D, which is someone that proclaims that when he takes it and he runs to the place where everyone is, he's able to clearly see it and read it. That's what it actually means, is that it's literally being carried by a messenger that didn't write it, so he needs to be able to speak it and say what it is because it's something that's coming later. Now, we've taken this passage and we've centered it around vision writing and hoping and dreams and things like that. But this is an Old Testament passage. And we know that in the New Testament, on this side of Christ and his death, the way that we receive and we read vision is much different. It's not the same as being written on tablets or for somebody else to have to proclaim it. But Jesus died so that the veil will be torn and he can speak to us heart to heart and spirit to spirit. And so... In the next passage, on the next slide, I'm sorry, we're talking about a new way of writing and receiving vision. And so I want you to go to Hebrews 8 and 10, and I'm moving quickly. Hebrews 8 and 10, and it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then 2 Corinthians 3, 
1 through 3, and it says this. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need some letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. And so when we're talking about a new way of receiving and writing vision, I want you to go to um, slide five, and I hope y'all can see it because there was some transfer from this Apple device to, you know, regular PowerPoint. But it says, I made this quote, a vision written on the heart is what makes any vision written on paper a possibility. When the Lord begins to speak to us and give us vision, it is written on our hearts because it's spirit to spirit, voice to voice, where he begins to put it in our heart first. Sometimes when we sit down and we start writing out this vision and the things that we want to do and where we want to go in life, and it hasn't really settled in our heart what it is that needs to happen and the direction that the Lord wants to take. Sometimes we're just writing and we're, we're busy in ourselves with busy work and, and all of this stuff, even some of the influence that is associated with culture, like this idea of manifesting. Everybody just be manifesting everything. I'm just going to manifest this and manifest that, and I'll get to that later. Because it's almost like they've taken Christian principles and muddied them to be able to say, I'm going to manifest anything. But sometimes if you have not taken the time to process vision written on your heart to be translated to paper, this is where the frustration comes in, where everything you thought would happen and you want it to happen, you're starting to sit and say, now, wait a minute, nothing is happening. And so slide six, how is true vision developed? How is true vision developed? And when I say true vision, I'm talking about vision that is weighty. I'm not talking about like, you know, stuff like I want to get, you know, I, I want a new car and I, I want that, like just things that are very um, just surface. But when I talk about vision that is true, it is something that serves you and it serves others and it serves the kingdom of God. A car is nothing to God. If your faith is just believing for a car, you're believing less than. If you're believing just for a little bit of money, you're already less than. That's not vision. Vision is something big. It's weighty. Like I said, it serves you and it serves others. And so how is true vision developed? And I'm actually getting um, pretty close to the end. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 14. And I give you a lot of scripture because I really want um, a love of the word to start to translate in your spirit. And so um, 1 Corinthians Chapter 2, 9 through 14. How is true vision developed? And it says, But things which eyes have not seen, and ear has not heard, and which has not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. But for to us God revealed them how? Through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. When you are talking about how true vision is developed, y'all know every last single message I preach is going to lead back to the spirit. It has to be by the spirit that any vision is developed. We literally have the Holy Spirit inside of us, which the Bible says is a down payment 
of what is given to us when we go to see the Father. But even a down payment, the power of this down payment, the fact that it says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. This is the same power that speaks to you, that, that intercedes for you, that fights for you. This is not something small or something to just glance over, but everything that you need to know about your life and what to hope for and have vision for is found by the leading of the spirit. And so I did another quote in slide eight and it says, crafting vision is a shared partnership. It is the expression of hope, desire, interest, and purpose from heaven to us and back again. It is not one-sided, it is a joined belief. And so this is where you take all of your desires and all of your hope. Let's just start with a year, because I'm talking about what your 2024 looks like. Y'all got just like a month and a half to clean this year up. Or, or to like do, because some of y'all have been living your best life that was your worst life. And so you got like about, you know, you got a month and a half to kind of get a head start because you can shape how your next year looks. And so what I don't want you to do is go around the mountain again and again trying to go after these things on your own when the reality is vision from God is something that is it's, it's, it is so spirit-led, you guys. I wish I had the language for it. It starts with impressions in your heart, where you start to be able to sense what God is saying for now and how he's leading. And then he'll start to confirm these things, and he'll start to direct you. We're looking for this booming voice that come out of the sky that says, Now I say unto you. And it doesn't really work that way. It comes through fellowship where he starts to direct you and you express to him your desires and you express to him your needs and you express to him your wants. And they can be small or they can be big. And I promise you, if they're positioned before him, not as a demand, but as an open dialogue where you are looking for God to speak to you and direct you, he will answer you. The thing is, though, He's going to do it by the Spirit. And if you are not familiar, if you have not entertained the Holy Spirit in your life, you're now left to try to figure out and decipher. It is so important that your fellowship with the Lord and your prayer life with him be such an open dialogue because the confirmation that you need that you're going in the right direction it can come in so many different forms, but if his voice and his leading and his answers are foreign, you will miss it. And so when you're talking about your vision and where you're going over the next 365 days, it is found through the Spirit. And I want to say this because I think that this is so important. And if you don't hear anything else that I say tonight, please hear this. God cares about what you desire. He cares about what you desire. I don't know where it came from that we're not to go into prayer and ask for things. And, you know, you got to spend an hour first praising him and telling him that he's wonderful and great and all of these things. Like, listen, I'm not going to say that God doesn't need that from you, but to feel like you have to do that as a precursor before you ask for anything Listen, that's not true. How many times as a parent do your kids call you and just flat out ask for something? And you'd be like, okay. You're not mad that they didn't say good morning or whatever else. You might check them because, you know, of manners. But it's the fact that they belong to you and you care about what they need. And we're human. God cares about what you desire. He wants you to put your desires before him and open a dialogue and conversation. I cannot tell you how many times something as small, I mean, it, it, it's been some of the smallest things that I've asked for that I've watched the Lord just do. And it's like, man, you know, I, I only prayed about that this morning or I only brought that up in conversation 
this morning, and he'll do it because he cares about your desires. And so when you're talking about crafting a vision, you absolutely positively need to put your desires before the Lord, especially if you're looking for marriage, please, by the Father's hand, merciful Savior of all creation, the anointed one, the Lamb of God that reigns supreme, please ask him about somebody y'all dating. Please ask him about somebody y'all dating. The, wait, I don't feel like I said enough. King of kings and Lord of lords. <laughs> what I miss? Yes, he is. Please ask him about somebody you're dating. And listen, be prepared. If he come back and say, they're not the problem, you are. Because this is the thing. It's important to say, Lord, I, I want to be married. Like, I desire marriage. I desire to experience what it's like to be in that union. And then God will start to prepare you for that, even if the person is not there in your face. It'll be little things like go and get a job and keep the job. Go and get the job and keep the job. Because listen, l let me say this. this the, I, I know it exists from some, for some people, but this idea of a one-income household where somebody's going to marry you and just take care of you, y'all, that don't really exist anymore. Only in certain communities. You, there, everybody has to have something to contribute to a home. Even if it's, hey, I'm going to be the stay-at-home mom that cleans the house, that works hard, that teaches the kids, that do these things. Like, there is a contribution. And anybody that has worked hard to build their life from a place of discipline is not looking to just marry somebody and just to take care of them. They're looking for some sense of contribution. They are, and it's, it, listen, it's nothing wrong with that. It's nothing wrong with that at all, with saying, hey, this is a partnership. We can do more together. And so sometimes the Lord will start to deal with the practical things. He'll start to deal with health and start to deal with all of these things. But it starts with you expressing desire to where you're actually saying, God, this is what I want. Lord, I want to get out of debt. I want my finances to look better. And God will start to direct you. He'll start to give you what you need to be able to have discipline concerning your finances. But sometimes these things don't start until you express desire. And so here are what I consider the four vision categories. And I'm really trying to teach tonight because I'm trying to give you all tools that when you go home, these are the areas to start to focus on with the Lord because you're saying, how many people really say, I want my 2024 to look different? I want it to look different. I, wanna, I actually want to start now with my life looking different. And so even though the vision is written on our heart, these are the categories that I want you to start to express desire before the Lord so that he can start writing the vision on your heart, and then you can put it on paper. And so the first area is spirituality, and I want to lead with spirituality because spirituality, I don't want to go around that. That's not last. That's not somewhere in the middle. It is first. Your relationship with God, you should always be striving and pushing for it to be better to where you're hearing him better, you're being led better, that when he's telling you certain things, you don't obey at the fifth time, but let's try to get graduate to at least the third or at least the second, and let's try to get to the first to where there's some trust built so that when God is telling you something you don't like, you know that this is for your good and you do it anyway. It's a sense of growing in your spiritual walk to where you're saying, God, I desire to hear your voice more. I desire to be able to pray for people and hear from you for people. Like, we need to have a spiritual vision. It shouldn't just be, well, I just want to go to church or I just want to be a good Christian. No, there needs to be some goals surrounding it to where you say, Lord, I want to level up in a different place with you. 
where it's a desire that's expressed before him. Then there's family and relationships. And I know some people may say, well, family is relationships. But I really want to put some distinction there because one thing I found, sometimes we treat people better than we do our family. Listen, we'll go out of our way to patch up uh, relationships with people, but then we'll kind of make our family on the back burner because there's this familiarity that just says, well, they just like that. You know, they kind of just like that and they ain't going to change. But because we're unfamiliar with somebody else, we'll kind of just tend to gravitate to those. But if there is any brokenness or unforgiveness in your family, God cares that it is healed or that there is an attempt. There is a conversation that has to take place. And I understand that this can kind of rub you the wrong way because right now I have some situations in my family um, that, that affect me but not directly. But this is the thing. Sometimes when... People in your family do something to like your mom or your dad. It's kind of like, now you should have picked somebody else. You know, you don't mess with my mama or my dad. And there's been some situations in my family over the last 11 years since my father has been sick. It's always the people that don't help that have an opinion. Like, why you got an opinion? See, y'all going to get me started. Lord, number two is for me. It's for me, y'all. You know, you, you don't help, you don't do nothing, but you really got an opinion. And there's this sense of like, you know, where you try to, you try to mediate. I'm gonna be honest with y'all. And if they watching tonight, well, praise the Lord, watch on. And so, you know, you try to mediate and I love the Lord, and I believe in peace, and I believe in harmony, and I tried to mediate this situation, and then my other brother, who's a pastor, tried to mediate the situation, and we thought everything was fine. And then, next thing you know, the situation blows up, and at this point, my siblings that are about it, about it, that are ride or die, was like, well, we're gonna mediate it. And so I was like, well, all right then. And so next thing I know, my sister in her car with a carton of eggs and got my mama in shotgun. I said, do not. <laughs> I can't, you, <laughs> I will bail my mother out, but you gonna sit in there. <laughs> you know, and it's like, I said, now listen, trying to mediate and heal it and fix it. But this is the thing. The people that I was trying to mediate it with are also believers. So I'm like, what is going on here? That can make it so hard because you feel like you're living by the same laws and principles. So why isn't this something that can be fixed? But this is the thing. I am committed to trying to heal it. Now, if it doesn't heal and if it doesn't get fixed, I have a responsibility as a believer to revisit it as I feel led by the Spirit because he'll lead you when to revisit it. But it should not just be something that you have in your heart like, well, I'm done. I'm done. I don't care. I don't want to talk to him. Any unforgiveness. And so when you're thinking about where your vision is going over the next year, you need to be evaluating how you do relationships. It is abnormal to always be into it with people. And I wanna move on to the next one, but it is abnormal to always have conflict with people everywhere you go. Now, if it's just one place, Okay, we might give you a pass, but if it's at work, it's at church, it's with the neighbor, it's at, with the man at the gas station, it's with the daycare teacher, it's with this person, that person. At this point, you're a common denominator. And so you have to evaluate how you do relationships, where your social abilities are. Then there's finances. All of us are trying to get to a better place financially. I really am trying to get to a place where I have something to leave to my children. This isn't about, Lord, I want to make this money so I can go buy this and go buy that. I literally sit and think about what we're able to leave to our children. And so with that has come so much sacrifice. I wish y'all could understand. Sometimes, and this is the thing, and I'm... I'm getting close to closure. I want to say this. 
One of the things that stops us from being able to fulfill any of these things is that we are not prepared for the difficulty that comes with doing it. You literally, I'll never forget when I started um, intermittent fasting, when I wanted to lose the baby weight, I had gained 50 pounds in between getting married and having kids. And it was just to the point that it was like affecting my knees and it, it just was really affecting my body, like my function as a person, and I was too young. And I just remember trying all of these different, you know, diets. And the reality is, y'all, I like to eat what I like to eat. I, I don't want no salad with seeds. <laughs> I want grass with a little drizzle on it. That's not for me, y'all. I like to eat what I like to eat. So I said, I'm gonna try intermittent fasting because as long as I make my window, I can eat some piping hot fries with some wings and, and wash it down with a Coke. This is what it was on my heart. So before I started intermittent fasting, literally for a month, I would sit and watch these videos. I would sit at work and watch these videos about the body and fasting and detoxing and all of these things because I was trying to prepare my mind for the difficulty of it. So once I started, it was like clockwork. I did not back off, I did not cheat, I did not have any problems because I had all of the information here that said, this is how it's gonna be and if you just hold on until seven o'clock, you're gonna have some hot fries with some wings dipped in ranch in your mouth and you're gonna be happy like never before. And so, Listen, if you don't prepare yourself for the difficulty of what it's going to take to get out of debt, to be able to go to people that are hard, that you're genuinely angry with, or in spaces where I have to choose if I'm going to watch my show or if I'm going to pray, if you don't start to prepare yourself for the difficulty of it, as soon as it presents itself, you back down. Then the last part is purpose and creativity. And I put this in here because sometimes we tend to kind of feel like um, purpose and vision, like they work hand in hand. But this is the thing, and I said this the other day on Facebook, and I, I need to say this again. Sometimes what you have to do for now is necessary to get to where you want to be. We, we tend to think we have to work a job that we're in love with. This ain't even what I'm purposed for. Listen, you're not purposed to be broke. It feel good to pay some bills, even if you don't like the job. I cannot tell y'all how many jobs I've had to work where I sat there and say, I do not like this. I don't like the commute. I don't like what I'm getting paid. I don't like, there was a season after I came off of maternity leave that I was entering back into the workforce after being home for a year, and I accepted a position where it was a, a lesser role, which means I was making less, because I did not want anything interfering with me getting home to be with my children. The more clout that you have, the more they get to keep you, the more responsibility, you're at home still working, and I said, I'm going to enter back into the workforce, but I need to be available to my family. During that time that I was on that job for a year and a half, there would be some times that I would drive to work crying. I would get out of my car, walk, walking over to the building, literally having a conversation with myself saying, I don't like this, but this is temporary. I'm not going to be doing this forever. God has something different for me. Then when it was time for me to clock out, I would walk to my car saying the same thing. I would drive home saying the same thing. And I had to do this for a year and a half. But all of my bills were paid. And I did not have the stress of worrying about finances because I did not think that that job was tied to what I'm purposed to do standing up here. I did not need a job that had to feed into this, but this is the thing. Everything that I learned on that job for a year and a half has come into play with every part of what I'm purposed for, and I did not know it. If you think you have to like what you're doing, you'll never get to what you like to do. 
Sometimes what you don't like to do is feeding the ability to get to what you like to do. It is saving you from being in a hole and this idea that you gotta like it is keeping you from being successful. Sometimes it means humbling yourself and we think humility is this thing where you gotta let somebody beat up on you and all this. No, sometimes it's just being willing to say, this ain't what I wanted, but this is what's here. If you can't love the one you want, love the one you're with. This applies to a job too. Because I'm trying to tell you guys, there are certain disciplines that you start to learn when you're doing something that you feel like is less than what your purpose is. But this is the thing. I wasn't purpose for that. But at the same time, it positioned me to be able to do the things that I'm creatively called to do. How many creatives do I have in here? Everybody's hand need to be up. That's the first problem. Everybody in here has been given creative ability. We tend to think that creativity is music and writing and, and, and fashion and art. You have been given creative ability and you find out what it is through the spirit. And so as you start to express before the Lord your desire for spirituality, your desire for family and relationships and finances, God will start to feed your purpose and your creativity. Because some of you guys are praying about things that God is saying, I've given you creative ability to change, but you won't do it. You won't do it because you think it's hard or you've been told you can't, or you have this idea that nobody's gonna help you, or you don't believe in yourself, or you're afraid of rejection. Listen, being afraid of rejection kept me down for a long time. Because as a creative, when you create, and this wasn't even my note in my notes, so I know the Holy Spirit is leading me. <clears throat> when you create, you are creating for two reasons. You're creating for your own therapy, but you're creating for consumption. When you create, you want people to take in the beauty of whatever it is you're creating and consume it, or at least understand it. Sometimes people will, will reject whatever is presented. And if you don't understand that rejection is a part of the process, you will never present anything it's almost important that you get rejected over and over and over again because it starts to teach you how to be firm in the belief of what you have and what you carry. And so as I get ready to close, <clears throat> I wanna say that once you've expressed these beliefs before the Lord, and once you start to craft your vision, where do you go from there while you're waiting for it to change, while you're waiting for it to form, while you're waiting for it to come to pass? Proverbs 18 and 21, and this is my last scripture. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. This is where, once you've crafted your vision, and you felt the leading and the confirmation of the Lord, you start to declare over what it is you've presented that it shall come to pass. This is when you begin to affirm and speak affirmations over yourself, over your vision, over your desires. This idea of naming and claiming, listen, y'all, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something, a vision, that has come together through your partnership with the Lord where he has confirmed and affirmed in your life, this is something that we're going to do together, that you begin to declare over it. Because many times, and the Lord has um, dealt with me about this over and over, and even recently, even last week, he began to talk to me about proclaiming. Those of you that know that you're gifted prophetically, one of the worst things you can do is begin to speak ill will against anything that God has established in your life. Because we literally have creative ability with what we speak with our words. And so when you start to speak against any vision or anything that God is trying to establish, you're literally 
planting seeds of unbelief in your own heart where you start to believe that it's not possible for it to happen or you start to form and shape conclusions through your words and the Lord is saying start to speak life to what it is that I have spoken to you and spoken over you can you all stand to your feet while we're talking about <clears throat> speaking over um, vision and speaking over desires. I do want to say this, and I'm saying this to the whole manifestation community. I'm going to manifest it. I'm going to name it and claim it. The last slide says, do not decree and declare anything not submitted in prayer. Do not decree and declare anything that you have not submitted in prayer. Because sometimes when you start to decree things and you start to declare things and you, you express desire before the Lord, he will start to correct and align so that he can truly give you what is yours. He'll start to say, that's all you want. That's so low budget. I have something so much better for you. That's, that's all you want? That's nothing. Let me tell you what's really available to you. You're asking for that small thing. If you could just get your faith up here like, this is what I have. This is what is possible for you. But you're, you're declaring this, and I, I have this. But you haven't expressed desire. You haven't expressed these things before me, so you don't even know that this is available. You're just asking for this, and I don't want to give you this. I want to give you this. And I really feel tonight, as I, as I was in the um, office just studying, I kept hearing the Holy Spirit say, and the truth, will set you free. He kept saying, and the truth shall set you free. And I feel like there are those of you that are in bondage to fear. There are those of you in here that are in bondage to someone else's opinion of you. There are those of you that are in bondage to your opinion of yourself. And it has created slavery because that's what that whole passage is surrounding. And the Lord wants to break that tonight. Because you're not going to be able to effectively carry the vision he has for your heart with all of those things present. And so even now in this moment, just lift up your hands. Father, I pray right now over every last single person that is present. I thank you for your vision for their lives. I thank you that you know better than we do what lay ahead of us. I thank you for purpose. I thank you for vision. I thank you that you are literally waiting for us to present before you our desires. I thank you that you are li lifting off this caution that we come before you with where we are so cautious that we censor ourselves and right now we remove the censors in our relationship with you where we will begin to speak to you and share our heart and share our feelings and our emotions and our plans and our desires. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this experience with us where you start to craft vision and write vision on our hearts and begin to show us. We lift off this side of us that is so tame with you, where we feel like we have no license or no authority to come before you boldly. And even now we come before you boldly. We come before you boldly. I pray for those, Father, that desire a greater spiritual place with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
it is our sincere hope that you not only enjoyed, but were encouraged by the message. If you would like to sow a seed into the ministry, you can do so by visiting www.verticalencounter.church slash donate. You can also text any dollar amount to 84321. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day. He's not done with you yet.